All righty. So I guess it's about time to begin. Um, so I, I'd love to begin by just sharing um, the town of Wichert Stouffville's uh, land acknowledgement. Um, so the town of Wichert Stouffville acknowledges this land is the treaty territory of the Williams Nations. It's also the traditional territory of other Anishinaabe peoples, including the Huron-Wendat and the Haudenosaunee. We also recognize the contributions of all Indigenous peoples to this place and commit to a continued dialogue and greater respect for the land we have come to share. This recognition of contributions and historic importance of Indigenous peoples must also be clearly and overtly connected to the collective commitment uh, to make the promise and the challenge of truth and reconciliation real in our community. Uh, I'm Tyler Urbano, and I'm so happy that you could all join us today to chat with Emmanuel Osahor, exhibiting artist um, who's presenting the solo exhibition, What We Tend, here at Latchem. Um, it's a wonderful exhibition of paintings, etchings, and sculptures, all recent work, and we're so happy to have it here at Latchem. So thank you, Emmanuel. Um, maybe I will ask uh, Maeve if you wouldn't mind uh, starting the slide deck um, so people can see some of the show um, while we chat about it. Um, Everyone sees see. it okay? Yeah, yeah we good. Can. Perfect. Um, so maybe I'll do uh, your bio, Emmanuel, and then maybe you can tell us where you are. Sure, sounds good. So born in Nigeria, based in Toronto, Emmanuel Osahor uh, holds an MFA from the University of Guelph and a BFA in art and design from the University of Alberta. His work has been presented in multiple solo and collective exhibitions, including at Band Gallery, the Art Gallery of Guelph, the Power Plant Contemporary Art Gallery, um, the Museum of Contemporary Art Toronto, and the Art Gallery of Alberta. In 2014, Emmanuel was the provincial winner for the BMO First Art Competition representing Alberta. And in 2018, he received an honorable mention at the 20th RBC Painting Competition. Recently, he was announced as the winner of the 2021 Joseph Plaskett Award uh, for painting. His work is held in multiple public and private collections, including the Art Gallery of Ontario, the Art Gallery of Guelph, the Royal Bank of Canada, the National Bank of Canada, SNAP Gallery and the University of, of Alberta. He's currently represented by Gallery Nicholas Robert, and he's a busy guy. You've got shows here, Gallery Nicholas Robert, there's one at MOCA, and you've got things coming later this year too, so a lot mm -hmm. going on. Uh, so where are you joining us from now, Emmanuel? Uh, I am currently in Bath, England. Um, which is a lovely town about an hour and a half west of London and it is 11 p.m. so I'm sleepy <laughs> but I'm very happy to be here. <laughs> um, I imagine there's lots to, to study over there in terms of um, you know Victorian gardens and, and those types mm -hmm. of things but what are what brings you overseas? Yeah so um, Kind of the first thing was a large part of it. This is because of the Plaskett Prize. Um, so the Plaskett Prize um, affords a Canadian painter an opportunity to travel in Europe for um, up to six months. Um, and so I won the prize in 2021, but was unable to travel up until now. Um, and so this has sort of been my, my Plaskett trip. Um, being in Bath is, is related to research in the sense that, just like you said, it's it's surrounded by quite a number of National Trust gardens. Um, and it's a really interesting place to sort of think about English garden design, the history of English garden design, um, and also just to be in really interesting places that have been created with the idea of um, sanctuary and leisure in mind. Um, and there's a really wonderful printmaking studio here called Bath Artist Printmakers. And so I'm doing a little residency there where I'll be working on a series of etchings um, for the next, over the next two months. That sounds fantastic. Sounds like there's a lot um, packed into that time. Mm -hmm. um, so I know I'm excited to see what comes out of that time and you yeah. know what the next series of, series of etchings uh, brings. Mm -hmm. But um, 
just in chatting with you and talking about your work, you know, visiting your studio, I've learned that a lot of your work um, that focuses on gardens, mm -hmm. um, they actually start as photographs and then collages. So I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about that process and the, the role that the collages play. Yeah, um, the collages were, sort of were actually a, a pretty pleasant surprise I stumbled on um, while I was in graduate school is sort of going through a season of, um, you know, struggling with painting, not really knowing, um, you know, why I was painting specific places and, and what that all meant. Um, and so I kind of took a break. I took a break from painting for a whole semester, which is a scary thing to do when you're in grad school. Um, but it was yeah, probably the best thing that could have happened to me. What what happened was I, I, I how a lot of how the work starts is I, I I take a lot of photographs of gardens just as I walk around. Um, at the time I was living in Guelph, so you know on my walks I would photograph people's gardens either for, just from the outside. Sometimes I would go up to people and say hello and ask if I could document their garden more extensively. And I sort of been building up this database of just hundreds of photographs of people's gardens and um in the studio once I started working with the collages it, it kind of opened up this possibility for me where the paintings became less about a specific place and more about creating the possibility of a new place um and that's what the collages really did for me was it enabled me to start to take parts from other people's gardens almost a, as as a form of like seedlings in a way and create a, a garden that doesn't actually really, that doesn't exist in reality, but is based on the real. Um, and that sort of opened the doors for me to start to think about the paintings and the work that I'm making as this, this way of thinking about possibility and creating um, new spaces um, that are, that are fictional constructions. Yeah. Um, I love yeah. um this idea that you know there they are fictional places but I can't help but imagine myself there and I can't help um you know because they've come from collages from photographs they have hints at these real places but they don't exist in real life as they yeah. presented in front of us um yeah. one thing that you know ties them all together and we've certainly gotten a lot of comments on, from visitors to the show is this idea of beauty um, mm -hmm. and really focusing on um, like presenting beautiful spaces but you know beauty can do beauty can do so much it's, it's mm -hmm. not just you know that's where the work stops so I'm wondering if you can talk about this idea of beauty and the, the power that it has in your work yeah um, the just continuing off of the you know the you talking about the real in the in the paintings i think something that i find really interesting about the work is that places can feel familiar um even when they don't don't actually exist um and and that's something i think is 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 really interesting for me with, with the work where it's almost sort of like um i construct this image but then somehow i feel like oh i've i've been in this place or i will be in this place um and, and that ties into the the kind of pondering and thinking through beauty in the studio and, and with this work. Um, I think probably the, the best way to talk about it is like, maybe going back a bit to even like why I take photographs of, of, of garden spaces. Um, and, you know, this was something that kind of like took me a while to understand because I was doing it as a almost sort of like impulsive action. I was spending a lot of time, you know, photo, I would, yeah, I, would, I was make, taking a lot of photographs and didn't really know why until through conversations with a friend once I kind of realized like, oh, it was, you know, stopping to look at these things was almost a form of and a way of taking care of myself in the midst of, you know, reading the news in the midst of, um, dealing with things in life, it's sort of like you stop and you appreciate something beautiful. And it it, it was a um, it was something I was doing subconsciously, not really realizing why. Um, 
And then when things sort of pivoted for me in the studio was when I realized that, okay, like, you know, I would like to extend that experience um, of coming across a neighbor's garden and being like, wow, look at that plant or wow, look at the way the light hits that surface. Um, um, I would like to extend that, that experience into um, what it's like for me to make a painting in the studio and also what it's like for someone to look at my paintings in the gallery. Um, and that really got me sort of thinking a bit about, and it's, it's, it's what I'm, I keep, um, it's what I'm, um, continuously pondering is just sort of like, you know, we live in pretty trying times, um, for a num number of reasons. Um, and on the one hand, sometimes it feels like a frivolous thing to sort of be like, hey, can we stop for a minute and like recognize the the beauty um, in our lives or recognize the beauty in each other? Um, it feels like a very frivolous thing. But on the other hand, it, to me, it feels like a very necessary thing in order to like help me to continue to exist. Um, and so in the work, there's... I hope there's this tension, right? Like, you know, on this slide, there's the the painting, I've been afraid of my own shadow, um, which is the the only painting in the show that sort of has a um, a more uh, clearly stated human presence in the sense that like there's my shadow and taking the photograph and reflected in the painting. Um, but it's quite a dark, um, painting is quite a dark piece. Um, there's some sort of scraping and there's some uh, fragility in the material um, when you're looking at the work. And so, yeah, it's, there's this tension, right? Like you're, you, you sort of, or at least I sit with this tension of recognizing and, and understanding for myself the necessity for pondering and creating space for an experience of beauty. Um, because of um, the realities of heavinesses that many of us are dealing with and sitting with? I, it's a very long-winded answer. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> well, in, within that answer, you touched on so many things. And, um, you know, the first thing that resonated with me was this idea of, you know, appreciating something beauty or beautiful. Um, our first impulse is to think that it's frivolous, but in mm -hmm. reality you know these days it could that couldn't be further from the truth i mean mm -hmm. um i know that some of your work touches on um you know beauty as um you know crafting beautiful spaces and presenting them here as um like crafting an ethic of care mm -hmm. um, for for marginalized communities um mm -hmm. today actually though i am thinking about what's going on right now with all the wildfires that are all over Canada yeah. and North America. Um, yeah. The anxiety of that, of listening to it on the radio on the way to work, seeing it on TV after work, um, smelling it in the air, there is yeah. a real um, almost involuntary um, reaction to your show of this like calm mm. that comes over you that's ne like that's necessary to yeah. really that anxiety. So I think yeah. there is like the beauty in this way can often be um, underestimated. And I think your, your show does a good idea or does a good um, job of showing the power of it. Yeah. Like something I think about a lot is like, yeah, like I think in like artist statements have sort of said like beauty as a necessity for survival and a precursor to thriving. And, mm -hmm. and it's sort of like, yeah, honestly, there are days when I get into the studio or, did, you know, I, I try, I have a bad habit of like waking up in the morning and the first thing I do is I read the news. Um, and oftentimes I'm just like, well, you know, better just go back to bed. Um, but yeah, there are days that I go, I go into the studio and it like, yeah, it's heavy. Um, and, and I don't, the work isn't, yeah, it's, it's, you know, I think about what, what might be necessary um what do we need in order to begin to, in order to sort of get to a place of i don't even know what you would call it but a place where you can actually reflect um, a place where you can actually start to think a place where you can actually start to 
piece things together, a place where you can actually start to say, what do I want to keep? What do I want to remove? A place where you can actually sort of like, I feel like for me, when a lot of this work started, I was in a place of just intense anxiety. Um, and um, I started gardening uh, and that, that really helped. Um, having these moments where it was almost sort of like, you know, the thoughts kind of slowed down and you can start to sort through it. I don't think the work, you know, can propose any answers. I don't, I don't, I don't know any answers, even myself. Um, but, you know, what does it look like to create a space that I can and hopefully we can collectively gather around and, and start to sort through these things? Or not start to, because we already are, but, you know, a place where we can do it. Yeah, and I use the word like a place to gather. Um, mm -hmm and start to sort through these things and you you already sort of touched on it with the um the painting i was afraid of my shadow but mm -hmm. it's so much of your work um shows traces of human involvement in the garden in some way but there there are no humans and i was wondering if you could touch on that mm -hmm. that maybe it's a deliberate choice yeah it it has been um a deliberate choice um and I've kind of oscillated. I've, I've, um, I guess the, the direct way to say it is that I've been worried that to include the figure, to include a, a visible body, um, in some ways creates the separation, um, where it feels like, oh, that is the space, that space belongs to that person, um, and doesn't necessarily belong to the viewer. I think one of the things that is really important for me is that the viewer always feels like they can insert themselves into the space. Um, and I don't, I don't know why, I think it's just been an artistic hang up where I just sort of feel like once I've made a couple of paintings that have figures, but they've been very clearly that's the, that space belongs to those people. And I'm sort of witnessing their experience of the space. Um, but you know, like I think we've talked about it and I've talked with other friends where it's like, no, the 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 body is so clearly present. Um uh my my sister keeps teasing me that I keep painting chairs these days and and I see the chairs as a as a uh, almost like a, a very visible invitation for for someone to sit, you know. Um one of the paintings in the show is is a, a close up prop of like a lawn chair and it's a study for a larger painting that's called room for two um and it's yeah it's just two chairs outside and it's sort of like let's spend some time together there um so the the figure is constantly implied and um but i've been dealing with this tension of you know how do you make the spaces that feel accessible because a lot of these paintings actually i think something that is important to note is Many of the gardens that I photograph are people's private gardens, um, and either they either they become accessible either through friendship or through the speed of my cell phone. Um, but you know, so there is that tension of like a lot of these paintings begin from places where most people would not have access to. Um, but then it's sort of it's been important for me to make the work. Um, function in a different way where it actually is accessible to most people. Yeah, I think um, that's a really important point that you bring up. Like um, you talked about how a lot of these gardens are domestic spaces or personal gardens crafted by, mm -hmm. you know, homeowners or maybe not even homeowners, just people that have the space to sort of put their hands in the dirt. And yet mm -hmm. some of the spaces like um, the large two panel painting in front of us, um, since there are no other worlds, it, mm -hmm. it feels more like um, a garden space on the edge of a wood, or yeah. maybe one that's a little bit more open. Yeah. Um, and so I want I, I wrote down this question specifically, I'd love to just read it. So I yeah. get it right. Um, you know, there are uh, personal gardens, home gardens, backyard sanctuaries, the, the wooden gardens, like uh, the one in front of us, 
and more stately gardens. Um, I, I imagine the, the painting, what we tend with the faded chairs, the white chairs mm -hmm. to be a more like stately garden. Um, and all of this makes me think that makes me think of who the gardens were built for and who has access to them. And in terms mm -hmm. of that, that one painting, um, what we tend, I might even go so far mm -hmm. as to think about, you know, who relaxes in that garden and who has access to that space. And so it brings mm -hmm. in this idea of politics and a people. So I was wondering if you could chat about that for a bit. Yeah, like the, the sort of politics of, of access in the garden or two gardens. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think there's this, there's this funny thing, there's this transformation that occurs with the, with the painting process um, that I, I find quite fascinating. Um, so the, the painting, um, since there are no other worlds is it's actually a collage of like four different spaces. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, maybe that the before, body. Before you go on, maybe Maeve, could I get you to jump to the large pic, the large image of this yeah. painting? Yeah, perfect. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's, it's a collage of like four different places. Most of them were sourced in Guelph. And then the, the body of water, um, you know, was a, a patch of grass and, and, you know, in, in the collage, I was like, huh, I wonder what it would feel like. Cause you know, um, in, in larger gardens, they're actually not in larger gardens, in most gardens, there's, there's a body of water. Um, and it's sort of this, uh, in, in romantic painting, um, the body of water was the strategy to, that was used to direct your eye and move your eye towards the horizon. Um, and so it's playing with this technical, playing with that in this painting. Um, and then at the end, the painting, it's like, I, I was, I was stunned by the painting because it was like, oh my gosh, this is this, like you said, it looks like this wooded, vast landscape that came from very actually private, like dense and private spaces. Um, yeah, the, the garden is interesting for me because of, like, I think I said it earlier, the sort of the tension um there's this tension in beauty that I think is echoed really well um in gardens as well um so one of the one of the kind of tensions you brought up is the the differentiation between the public and the private space and and a way I like to think about that is like who gets you know to have the space who gets to afford the space to um to be able to make these things and how that sort of speaks to one of the realities that we live with, um, the sort of the sort of class indifference and, and financial precarity that many people live with. Um, but on the other hand, I feel like every gardener that I've met has been like extremely generous and inviting in terms of being able to say, hey, like look at this space and a willingness to actually share spaces that are from the outside seem quite private. So there's this tension there that I don't necessarily know how to reconcile um, for me, there's also the tension that lies in this idea of, of cultivating a space, um, and creating a space of rest or a space of sanctuary, um, and the work that actually goes into that and the sort of violence that occurs in the creation of those spaces. Um, but then that is also held equally with a sense of collaboration um, with mm -hmm. plants, with nature, with the weather, um, with, you know, with what will grow and what won't grow um, and the sort of constantly adapting. Um, so that's another sort of tension. Um, there's a tension around like, you know, what plants actually grow and um, where the plants, where did certain plants initially come from and what plants have sort of been pushed away and not sort of valued. Um, you know, on this land. Um, and then that's also kind of held, you know, that goes hand in hand with the fact that plants adapt and survive and thrive, just like we try to do. Um, and so there's this cost, I feel like for me, the politics of the garden is, is one of like, irreconcilable tension that I think 
really echoes um, the politics of, I guess this is a grand statement, but <laughs> the politics of being human, yeah. um, where, you know, things are just sort of held in, in constant tension. And at least for me, it feels like things are held in constant tension and I can't, um, can't necessarily parse it other than to sit with it. I don't, does that, does that yeah, make makes, any sense? It makes total sense. I think yeah. one of the things that you said that the tension between this like violence that we enact in the garden and then the, the kind of uh, what we ask of the plants that we're mm -hmm. putting in the space. And yeah. I had never thought of it um, that way before, but, you know, having just um, ripped up a backyard garden myself, mm -hmm. it makes a lot of sense. And it, so there's like ripping up of sod and turning over soil and taking out things that you deem, you know, not really worthy of taking up that space. And then, mm -hmm also planting something that might have come from a nursery that's so small and just almost willing it to take up more space like oh the yeah. lavender will fill in this, this whole area, area. <laughs> yeah we'll we'll let it do its work we'll just put it there yeah. for now and mm -hmm. that you're right the tension is there if we're if we're willing yeah. to just stop and look for it and um mm -hmm. i i love that the work in this show and like all of your work doesn't necessarily point to direct answers it allows us to come to that understanding as we as we will yeah um, yeah. yeah it's a beautiful yeah. thing yeah um a lot of the a lot of sort of the like gardener artists that i've been like sitting with as i've been thinking through this work um like there's um there's a writer an american poet named ross gay who just like every time i I read their work. I'm just like they. They said it best. Why? Why do? Why do I even try? Um, but I try because I think I'm in a conversation with them as well. But um, uh, Roske has this book that I read recently called "Inciting Joy," um, in which he actually talks about sorrow and grief as not being the the opposite of joy but almost being the 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 thing that brings joy into existence mm -hmm. um so joy isn't the absence of of sorrow but joy is a, is an awareness of of something because of an acknowledgement and a an intimacy with sorrow um and i find i find that you know that I find a lot of beauty in that in just sort of being like these things are constantly held hand in hand and um to sort of not acknowledge that would be to lie in a way um or to um to minimize something um, mm -hmm. i was so happy when you introduced me to the work of ross gay um and i've been thinking about this uh there are other um there are other book I forget I'm forgetting what it's called but like the book of delights of, like where they wrote yeah, yeah, yeah. 100 yeah, poems. yeah the book of delights yeah like that to me thinking about that was like I can't believe I never thought of this before w would you yeah. mind just explaining the the ideation behind that book yeah so the book of delights um was is a collection of short essays written by Ross Gay and um yeah, I mean, everyone should read it if you, when you have time. Um, basically, Ross set an intention for himself where from one birthday to the next birthday, you know, if if it wasn't too busy or whatever, but every day he tried to write uh, a short essay about something he delighted in that day. Um, and for him, that was, he talks about it as being a way to train a delight muscle um, and I really resonated with that because, you know, I think that a large part of what this work is trying to do is to train a delight muscle um, um, in recognition of the fact that I think my anxiety muscles are pretty well honed, um, my fear muscles are pretty well honed, my sort of impending doom muscles are pretty well honed, um, my, my distrust muscles, my distrust of myself, my distrust of the world, my distrust of other people 
those muscles are pretty well honed. Um, and so for, for us, he was like, okay, well, what things, how do I hone a delight muscle so that I can, like what I was saying earlier, like you can see the beauty in each other and you can see the beauty in yourself and, and you can sort of like survive. Um, but again, like when you read this book, like there's certain moments in the book where you're like, this is a delight. Like some things are very heavy um, that he, that he touches on. Um, he talks about, you know, the, the constant conflation of blackness and suffering in, in, in the media. Um, and he writes, you know, really astutely about that. And, you know, you get to the end of the chapter and you're like, all we've talked about is how painful this is. Um, and then he says, well, the delight is that here I am writing a book of delights. Um, and I just thought that was so wonderful. So, yeah, um, shameless plug for us, Gay. Everyone should get that book, the book of delights, and read it to each other. Yeah, I think especially given the last five years or so, you know, everything that has happened um, with COVID, with the, you know, we mentioned in your essay with, you know, the resurgence of the Black Lives Matter movement and this, mm -hmm. you know, um, real spotlight on oppression of Black people against specifically like police. Yeah. Um, the, you know, LGBTQ issues that are also resurging right now, um, mm -hmm. Indigenous, like, it, the list is a mile long. And so yeah. the, the thought of training a delight muscle mm -hmm. um, is sadly new to me, but <laughs> makes yeah. so much sense. And um, yeah. I, I agree with you. Everyone should read Ross Gay. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's one way to train your delight muscle is to read Ross Gay because <laughs> yeah. he's also a delightful writer. It, yeah. I mean, yeah. 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 Um, before we move on from this specific painting, I wondered, um, because this is a really good example, uh, mm -hmm. drawing seems to have a really strong element in a lot of your work. I'm wondering if you yeah. can talk about, you know, the purpose of drawing and um, maybe the process too, because I feel like if you look closely and if people come in to see the show and they, they get up close to the paintings, they'll be able to see you know, mm -hmm. layers of paint that hide charcoal marks and then they're layered back on top and what the drawing mm -hmm. does. Yeah. Um, for, for me, the drawing is a way to, um, I mean, formally, it's a way for me to sort of find my place um, in, in, the, in the work. Um, the, the sort of technical processes of making these paintings like, um, half the time I get really lost, like making these like landscape paintings is like so annoyingly difficult. Um, but things just sort of slip around and I'm pouring paint and I'm pushing paint. And then very often I'm like, where am I again? Where does that branch terminate? Where are the leaves? Where did it all go? Um, and, you know, uh, yeah, I, I sort of, decided early on that I would just sort of not I would try to find my way back um as I was I was making the work um so then the decision to leave the drawn marks um for me felt like a a a, a way to invite the viewer into the reality that these are constructed and provisional spaces um like, you know, this painting, for instance, is seven and a half foot by 12 feet. And, you know, there is the possibility that you sort of see that and you're like, oh, my gosh, it's it's this grand thing that is almost too good to be true or whatever. But then you see the fact that it's like, you know, it's slipping away, it's falling apart, it's cracked in areas. Um, the, the drawing is hesitant in some areas and other areas it's a bit more assured but you you see that it's a made thing um I want like I love the fact that you get to see the layers and how things are sort of built up because again it speaks to the the notion of collage um um and really just sort of owns up to the fact that these are constructed um spaces um 
And I think I think there's a for me there's an invitation there, you know, for the viewer to kind of also like participate in the in the completion of the space. Um, you know, something I love is is moments where the negative space kind of starts to transition and you're like, is that the silhouette of a bird? Is that the silhouette of a leaf? Is that the silhouette of what? Um, I find those things to be quite, quite interesting for myself, even just looking at the work. So um, the drawing for me and the sort of gestural mark making, um, just, yeah, it creates this, it speaks to this notion of like, yeah, that it's constructed um, and it's provisional, like things, things, and shift or things may shift. I think, um, Maeve, maybe if you could go to the painting to see the dawn, the second largest uh, work in the show, because it really sort of, it touches on something that, or it shows something that you just talked about was this idea of things, um, pieces in the paintings that might have been laid out first, but are actually at the very top of the work. So. Mm -hmm. Um, in the top right hand corner, there's a, you know, why what I see to be a tree trunk with a, this like beautiful spot of light, but really yeah. there's, and it's so close to the surface of the painting, but really, I feel like it was one of the first layers that you put down. There's just a few washes there. Yeah. And I, you know, my intuition would say that, oh, it should be buried really deep. And then mm -hmm. it calls back to this idea of the collage, like it's almost a cutout that's that you, you know, you removed that thing. Yeah. Um, so I'm wondering if you can talk about that, the say the cutouts in the work and this idea yeah. of leaving something maybe intentionally vague so that we can fill in that blank spot. Yeah, um, I feel like, I think that moment in the painting, uh, I think a friend came into the studio and was like, I will take this painting away from you if you touch that area. Um, but yeah, this one was a fun one to work on because it, it yeah, it, there was a moment where it had it was it was the 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 faintest passes of paints um, were doing really marvelous things, and then there was another moment where I felt like I really overworked it, and there were moments where I had to sand back, and there were like it was just a lot of pushing and pulling. Um, the back and forth for me that kind of comes with the the you know the 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 areas that feel like cutouts or the areas that feel where the, yeah, the, in a, in a physical sense, when you think of how a, a, a painting is a, a, an accumulation of marks, it's like there are moments in some paintings where the part that has the least marks actually seems to be the part that sits the most forward. Um, what I, I mean, honestly, a lot of that is, is also the, playing with the paintings um, as the paintings are being made um, because because they're built off of these collages and they're not about a specific place and at a certain point in the studio when I'm working on the paintings um, and this kind of makes me want to talk about the the process of the etchings as well as a way of almost like distancing from the photograph distancing from the photographic so that I'm more um, immersed in the gestures of the space and the forms in the space um and then when working on the painting it really becomes a, a process of trying to create a create a space within the boundaries of the canvas um and i feel like as the as the work evolves it starts to create its own rules right like it starts to say here's where the foreground is or or here are the moments in the painting that are actually the the most high key and here are the moments of the painting that are actually the deepest shadows um and oftentimes that that deviates in a, an extreme way from where the photographic source actually came from or even what the etchings were doing it, um i like to think about it as like literally gardening on the canvas like you're pushing and pulling pushing and pulling and when it works it works um, and I don't always know why other than formally it's resolved um, and the space is operating in a way that um, feels authentic to itself. Something about that movement, um, and like when I say that it feels authentic to itself, I think what I'm trying to get at is 
you know that feeling when you're like in a garden and you know there's lights and you're looking at something but there's also wind and there's shadows that are being moved about because of the wind that's moving trees but you know how like when you're looking at something in the garden you're also very aware of everything else mm -hmm. um it's almost like yeah like the thing you're looking at only exists because of everything else around it in a way um and there's this to me garden looking does not feel like uh a pointed thing like all you're seeing is this it's sort of like you're seeing a, your your sight is being informed by many things um and i think in the paintings there is this attempt that or i am attempting to um yeah create these spaces that are constantly sort of in oscillation so that you you have that experience of not just being like fixed as to one particular point. I think this happens better in the larger paintings, whereas in some mm -hmm. of the, in the smaller paintings, I am trying to call your attention to a um, a particularly tender moment or a particularly intimate moment. Yeah, I definitely, I really feel that, especially when I stand in front of this painting and um, since there are no other worlds, I, I feel a sense of movement and like I'm seeing I am experiencing it more like I would experience in a garden where, you know, mm -hmm. the light coming through yeah. a Japanese maple sort of um, influences how you see the plants below and it's constantly mm -hmm. changing and you're really aware of the light and yeah. the, the sort of arrangement of things. Um, in a different way, I look at the etchings as a little bit more like just as beautifully intricate, but a little bit more um, still. Yeah. yeah they um and so maybe maybe if you could show us uh the etchings that would be really wonderful um yeah. they could you show us the full wall of etchings if you could they have this way of like quietly providing a path in mm -hmm. the gallery and so that one wall when you walk in and you look at these incredibly act, or, um, detailed etchings and you walk across the wall to take them all in it's almost a path like a, a yeah. unpaved path and then you turn around yeah. and you're you're really in a garden and because of the fountains there's you know there's sound and the fountains kind of extend the larger paintings into into 3 space off the wall yeah. um i wonder if you could talk about the etchings a lot of people had uh, that were here at the opening had questions about the sugar lift process Mm -hmm. um, could you talk us through that? Yeah. Um, so these etchings, I, I made them in collaboration with a, a printmaker in Toronto named Gideon Neef. Um, and that was just a blast. Uh, I, like, I'm in Bath uh, doing a printmaking residency. I love painting. I spent a lot of my time painting, but I feel like printmaking is, like, really my first love. Um, and the reason for that being the the process creates opportunities for a sort of um, collaboration with chance that I find very productive. Um, and so, for instance, like the sugar lift process is this process where you you're working on a copper plate and you basically mix up a simple syrup with some India ink. Um, and maybe some dish soap to, to make to kind of break the uh, surface tension. Um, other people use other things, but basically sugar, you use sugar and you draw on the copper plate with that. And uh, you know, yeah, I won't get super technical, but you draw with sugar on a copper plate and you coat it with a, a sort of resist and you soak the copper plate in hot water and the areas that have the sugar will lift. The sugar crystallizes, so it doesn't lift in like a smooth pattern. It lifts in the sort of irregular, dotted, gritty um, pattern. Um, and you never know how it's gonna turn out. You never know what your ground is actually gonna look like um, until you etch the plate and you sort of see the results. So these, these etchings, working with sugar lift and then it, it kind of creates this process where, you know, things go too far or things don't go far enough. 
um, and you're sort of like constantly navigating, moving back and forth, moving back and forth, which again, to me, feels like a gardening process of sort of being like, ah, I got to trim that hedge. Oh, I got to push this further or, oh, this isn't going to work. How do I sort of, um, how do I make the rest of the space work in relation to this part that I know I can't push any further, but, um, you know, how do I, how do I adapt, um, and so, so that, that's sort of the, I guess, the, the conceptual interest for it, as well as like, I, I really love the fact that we were able to show the etchings in relation to the painting, because a lot of the, the sort of gesture and the mark making, um, and yeah, the gesture of the drawing, a lot of those, a lot of those things are sort of found in the etchings, um, and then developed in the paintings, and then reported back to the etchings. Um, in and so there's there's a really beautiful relationship, I think, um, between the etchings and the and the paintings. And the some of the etchings, like Dame's Rocket, they have a real evidence of that layering that you don't always see in the paintings. Like some of the mm -hmm. paintings feel so um, resolved, like they could be complete spaces or you mm -hmm. know, spaces in real life. But yeah. some of the etchings, there's evidence of that layering because you've got, you know, um, slightly white marks and then mm -hmm. you've got um, like these darker marks over top. So is it, a, and then there's the aqua tint process, which I'm yeah. not super familiar with, but is, are yeah. you printing multiple times on the same piece of paper and registering or? No, so with the, with, with aqua tinting, um, and this is why I love uh, etching um, because you can you can on the same copper plate you can mix in multiple kinds of marks. Um, uh, so most of my etchings start off with one form of etching that's called soft ground, and then they move on to another form of etching that's uh, called sugar lift, and then they move on to another form of etching that's called aqua tinting, and then they move back by you know, scraping with a burner and sanding it back to get some highlights because I've over etched certain areas. Um, and then I'll do another sugar lift. So there's this, so the, the sort of layering that you see that is recorded on the, the paper is, act, is, is recorded initially on the copper. Mm -hmm. um, so the copper builds up this sort of history of, of, of mark. Um, and then you can then addition that and sort of replicate that history like over and over and over again um but it is it is a an accumulation of uh yeah it's an accumulation of of data of mark making you know. um i'm conscious of the time it's almost midnight there so i want to just mm -hmm. quickly touch on um the fountains you you talked yeah. about this relationship that the etchings have to the paintings i'm wondering how mm -hmm um the fountains factor in for you yeah no, you you put it beautifully um they are a way for me to extend the world of the paintings into the three three d in the into the three d to the three dimension whatever the english is <laughs> um uh to yeah to bring it into the viewer's space um you know, going back again to this idea of really trying to figure out ways to invite the viewer into the works. Um, so these are sort of an attempt, another sort of attempt at sort of being like, well, you're already in the space. Um, and then the space is sort of coming out and extending towards you. Um, but also like, well, not but also, and also, something we talked about uh, earlier as well, the, the reality of the sensorial aspect of actually just sort of like, you know, we, we experience in multiple senses. Um, and I loved making these. I made these um, with a ceramicist named Adam Williams at a studio called Clay Space Studio um, in Toronto. Um, and it's such a wonderful process making these with Adam, um, working with the material, um, seeing them sort of, you know, how they, they sort of transform when they're fired, um, and then assembling it all together. Um, I think the first, the first time I assembled one in my studio, 
um, yeah, I just stared at it for 30 minutes. <laughs> it was <laughs> like, wait, what? Um, for, yeah, it was a different speed. It was a different way of working for me. Um, so yeah, there is this relationship where they extend the space of the of of the painting, but I think they do offer something. Just like the etchings offer something different, the paintings offer something different. These also offer um, a different sort of a a different pace of looking um, to sort of really think about the gestural marks that are on the surface, like like we're seeing in the image above. Um, but also like for me, just watching the ripple effect that the fountain itself does make is, is something that, you know, it's something that I tried to achieve in the large painting um, since there are no other worlds, but the water just does it best. Mm -hmm. um, so like, yeah, I, 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 as much as I'm very happy um, that I'm in Bath and I really love everything that's happening now, I really wish I could be in Stoneville to sort of experience this um, because it really is, it's, yeah, it's such a gift to sort of bring these three sort of elements of my practice together um, and have them be in conversation. Because I, I, I do think there is a, there is a, um, there is a particular nuance that they bring out of each other. I think they can stand on their own, but there is a nuance that they bring out of each other. Mm -hmm. And I mean, for those of you that haven't um, haven't visited uh, Latcham and Stoville, um, the the entrance to Latcham is, are sliding doors. Um, mm -hmm. You know, we're we're in a a leisure center. And so when you get close enough, the airlock opens essentially, and the sound comes at you. And when that airlock closes behind you, you're really immersed in the sound. So to answer uh, Catherine's question, yes, they are, they're working fountains, bird baths, they, they circulate water. Um, and the sound is wonderful. They're, it's cool as well. We found they've like, they transformed the space. Mm -hmm. And Another thing is it's it's not lost on me that your the works on the walls are all about gardening and crafting a space and getting your hands in the dirt and it's you know not lost on me that that's exactly what you did to make these fountains is yeah. had your hands in the clay and sort of forming what they would uh, look like on the outside and how much water they would hold and these sorts of things so yeah. there is a real relationship there aside from just you know these are things that you would find in a garden mm -hmm. yeah. Um, I wonder um, maybe if now is a good time to open up questions from uh, the audience. Mm -hmm. um, you're more than welcome to uh, type questions in the chat or raise your hand with the, the raise your hand function and um, I can unmute you. So um, we've got a question here from Francis, who says, I look forward to seeing the exhibition. The word enchantment comes to mind and it feels sympathetic to the many sensibilities you are discussing. Enchantment, mm -hmm. especially with the inclusion of the fountains and the added sensorial quality of that. Do you think about enchantment as it relates to aesthetics? Yeah, I don't, I don't know if I particularly think about enchantment, but reading reading the question the 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 thing that comes to mind and maybe this is a different way of saying enchantment but something i i like to sit with a lot is is wander and and wander as as a as a tool for possibility you know like to sort of be in a space where you actually have the capacity to to imagine and then it's like okay like that's you know, that feels like step one. And then from that space, what sort of possible things can we imagine um, in the show, in the work that I have on Mocha, the sort of question I was asking there is like, what does it look like to imagine the possibility of a good future? Um, and I think, I think, you know, wonder or and enchantment sort of can be a, a useful, um, instigator for that yeah i'd say that that would be how I, I i think about it and sort of drawing like 
riffing off of that, it seems like wonder and enchantment are sort of running parallel to this experience that you were talking about where the painting as you're in the middle of making it sort of tells you how it's supposed to be made, like yeah. what it requires. And it takes you in this like amazing direction that you maybe didn't think it was going to go in. So it seems like it's maybe it's almost baked in. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and it's, it's, it's also what draws me to um, photograph a space in the, in the first place. You know, it's sort of being like, um, again, like to use the word enchantment, right? Like, um, wow, that light is incredible. What the heck is that plant? Um, or I've seen that plant before, but not like this before. Um, mm. um, there is this sort of, yeah, there's an invitation in that. Yeah. 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 So we've got a couple um, questions here, people raising their hands. I'm going to uh, ask Karen if she'd like to um, unmute and then they can start their video. But did I not say the right thing, Tyler? I think I hit. Oh, no, you it's good can to see, see you. you, by the way. Yeah, we can, can see you. We can me? hear you. Good to see you. I, I can't see myself, but I. If I tell you the machinations to get on this call, because I was supposed to be here at home for something. And so I started on the computer, then I jumped to the phone. So I was listening to it. It's kind of nice to hear your soothing voices on the drive home. And uh -huh. I'm sitting in my Thank house. You, <laughs> you know, uh, um, one, I have to come and see this show because in hearing the conversation about the work, it's kind of... Mm -hmm. Your last comment, um, Emmanuel, about the relationship between these different pieces, because mm. I, I know about the, your interest in each medium, yeah. obviously the um, large scale gardens because of the show we did at BAM. Yeah. But that relationship, I'm, I'm wondering if there, and you probably said this, but maybe it's just uh, extrapolating a bit more on this idea of how your interest in this work is almost a series of metaphors for the human condition, because mm -hmm. you talk about, um, I actually wrote down, let's see if I can actually find it, the, the a collaboration with tension. And it feels like yeah. this notion of, we walk through life as human beings, constantly managing different tensions. Yeah. Um, and so uh, I wonder if you can talk a bit about how your interest in you're you just as an artist you're at the core and it seems like you're interested in the human condition and how that manifests yeah. itself from yeah. these different works and then the collision of all yeah. of that in this particular place and then the other yeah. part of that and it, i guess just to comment on is if you're anticipating um the time and bath maybe impacting where you might go with mm -hmm. not just the etchings but also your painting like you're there as you're saying for the printmaking mm -hmm. but how do you think the printmaking might influence your painting and having this opportunity for this kind of immersive work yeah i also get to see you um good to see you i feel like uh, i just saw you last week i know we literally did um <laughs> i you know, I had a really, today I, I visited a uh, National Trust Garden and it kind of like brought me this realization because it's, I feel like sometimes with research and with making art, it's, there's this process of like, you sort of know you need to do something, but you don't fully know why. And then you do okay. it and you're like, oh, that's it. Um, but I visited this garden that is, uh, it's called Hip Cut Garden. Um, and it's, really a, it's a person's garden a lot a lot larger a, a, a bigger garden so now it's a it's a national trust garden um but it it had this really it was an interesting experience sort of bodily experience to to witness the sort of private space made public um and it kind of struck me that that's what i've been doing in these paintings because the, the paintings are not necessarily of um you know grand landscape per se they're 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 private spaces made large and made public um and i found that a lot of what i ended up doing was watching how people existed in those spaces 
um, watching people's enjoyment of those spaces, um, watching how many people were sitting alone and just looking. Um, yeah, so that I feel like that's that was that's important to to kind of note in terms of like what, starting to think about what I'm doing here and and what it is to sort of look at public spaces um, because the paintings I think fundamentally I am trying to create a space like Tyler was saying earlier that people can gather in or gather around um, and that goes to your 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 first statement about the human condition right like. Um, at the core of this work is is trying to create spaces that sustain me um, in the midst of my dealing with the human condition. And like Tyler and I, like we sort of talked about some of the politics and, you know, the larger societal things, um, racial injustice, climate emergency, um, marginalization writ large. But there's also the personal, right? Like there's also the mm -hmm. sort of, there's the stuff that isn't in the news and there's the stuff that we're, we're constantly sitting with as individuals. Um, and for me, it's, it's become really important to, you know, have my practice be a thing that just sustains me. And that's why I say, that's why I like, it's like, that's the big thing, but that's a large part. That's a large part of this, this emphasis on, on, on beauty, this sort of intention, the intention to sort of um, think through um, what, yeah, what, what is this act and what is this need to create um, sites that um, are beautiful. And in that, it's important for me to say that fundamentally for me in the studio, I have to find the work beautiful. Beauty is subjective. I don't know that other people will. I hope. Um, I hope they don't find it appalling. Um, and if they do, if anybody does, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> but fundamentally, the work is for me. And in sort of, it's sort of my attempt at sort of holding myself. But then, you know, we live in communities. And so then embedded in the work is, is an invitation and a sort of... Um, a hope that it's you know the sh the show we did at band right like the hope was that the 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 work would transform the space into a garden and people could come linger they could come stay for a while um so and I they think, did yeah yeah which was which was beautiful right because you you extend the invitation but you don't know what will happen mm -hmm. yeah so yeah Thank you. yeah I love just uh, jumping off of that and maybe. Um, thinking about what Karen was talking about, uh, how the work that you're doing with the etchings now, how those might influence um, the paintings of the future, the unknown paintings. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So there's that. I would love to hear the answer to that. But also, yeah. like you said, your work is for you. Mm -hmm. um, I think that, you know, maybe you didn't intend this, but the the lovely ambiguity of these flowers that I'm seeing on the screen right now makes them for me too, because I get to see what I get. What to you see, want to see. You know? Yeah. yeah. So that's very generous. I mean, yeah, that's such a generous thing. So anyway. Yeah. 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 yeah I think, I think for sure. And, and I do, I think that kind of goes back to what we were talking about earlier about the sort of familiarity and, and, and that's embedded in the works. And, and I think that's the, the power and beauty of abstraction of sort of um, when when a gesture when the gesture is prioritized um, and when you know a different sort of specific is focused on like it's true like in most of my work I, it's more important to sort of capture the feeling of the space than it is to capture the sort of um, particularity um, of of specific plants and and stuff and. And part of that is so that, you know, yeah, people can can wonder what they are. Um, and part of that is so that, you know, there might be things that exist in a different form later on. Like, you know, who knows what the future is? Um, so we have another question from Catherine. I'll ask mm -hmm. Catherine to unmute now. Hi, Catherine. Hello, Emmanuel and Tyler Hi. and everyone. Hi, um, 
you know, when you started to talk about being in collaboration uh, with the etchings and the mm -hmm. sculptures, uh, it I, I'm curious about the process. You know, when you go into collaboration with someone, do you come at it with an, a sense of what you want to make and then they tell you about the materials and the process? Or do mm -hmm. you hear something from them that has the work go forward into another direction? Yeah, a, a mix, a mix of all of that. Um, uh, with the the fountains are, are a good sort of way to illustrate it. So I had this vision of something that I wanted to create. Um, but I didn't have the technical expertise at all. Like I, I've, I, I'm not a ceramicist. Um, uh, I've never fired anything before, um, and luckily, um, someone introduced me to Adam Williams, and I sort of went to him, kind of with this idea and also like a plea for help. And I said, "Hey, I, I want to make this thing, and you know, is it even possible?" And he was like, "Yeah, but you know, here are the things that will have to shift." So all of a sudden. You know, my idea takes on a life of its of its own, um, yeah. and just like you're saying, like as I'm as I'm learning the material and I'm starting to learn the limitations um, of the material, then the work begins. The, the work transforms. The work shifts from what I initially expected, um, mm -hmm. which which produces like surprising <laughs> surprising things, like. One of the things about the fountains that I, I really love is in this image, you can sort of see there are these horizontal marks um, that, are, that kind of are around the this, this sort of circle. Um, but when you see the, the fountains in person, there are these horizontal marks and they're actually the imprint of Adam's hand in the clay as he's pulling the forms upward. And then sort of around those marks, I sort of add these sort of more gestural painterly marks. Yeah. Um, so you know, this 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 fountain would not exist without that collaboration. And it is, it's unique in its own way. It's not a mark. It's not a thing that I could produce by myself. And I think that's, you know, in many ways, that's the beauty of it. Yeah. It's very exciting to like mm -hmm. to have two hands in creating it together. Mm -hmm. and yeah. Having it develop. Yeah. yeah, that's, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks so much, Catherine, for that. Mm -hmm. um, and then the, maybe the final question, because I know it's late there, is from uh, Kathy. So I'll maybe, mm -hmm. Kathy? Hi. Hi, Hi Kathy. Kathy. Hi. Uh, sorry, I don't know how to turn on my camera. Um, mm -hmm. <clears throat> I did want to ask about the transition that you go through when you take your photographed images and collage them and mm -hmm. then the transition of transferring that into the paintings and into the mm -hmm. etchings and even into the fountains mm -hmm. like how was that process and sorry my dog um That's... how did it like how did that change was it what you thought it was going to be to what mm -hmm. it what the final product not the word product but your yeah. final painting was. Yeah. Yeah. Um, in, a, in a playful way, I would say the transition was very painful um, because a lot of what you're sort of confronted with um, in the collages, a lot of what I'm confronted with in the collages is just like the, the, the crazy amount of detail that is embedded in a photograph. Um, and then it sort of like shames me and my own sort of like facility as a painter where I'm like, I can't, I can't paint all these leaves. Um, and so there's this moment of tension, but really it's sort of freeing to sort of be like, okay, once the, the base structure, once the, the sort of underlying gesture of the image is, is, is sort of replicated, the, the photograph goes away, the, the collage goes away. Um, and really, it's just about contending with the thing that's in front of me, um, and and sort of respond, yeah, responding to it in its own way. And I think that's where some of the 
the the nuance comes comes in the with the ceramics the mark making again thinking about how the gestures from the the gestures from the etching are sort of applied to the gestures in the painting the mark making on the ceramics is um it's totally sort of loose and free form i i sort of have a ball of clay in my hand and i'm i'm literally just drawing into the clay um but i i i know that you know the the motions the gestures i'm repeating are gestures that have been found in the in the drawing processes that were involved in the etching and the painting and so yeah like a bit more directly there is a there is a, a period of tension where you know i'm trying to get away from the detail and and get at um yeah get at the sort of the feeling of the image um what it felt like to be in certain spaces and again gesture get at gesture um but once that transition happens i think that's the beauty of working with you know collage and photography and then painting and then etching and then ceramics is that things start to open up in an interesting way once you're responding to the material um and and it doesn't feel restricted after a while it, it actually feels quite quite open like there's you know there's a lot of possibility i hope that answered the yeah that's great. Thank you. Yeah. Well, maybe that's a good place to end. We're, we're nearing quarter after. Um, mm -hmm. So I just want to say, you know, thank you to you, Emmanuel. Thank you to everyone for joining us. Um, and there's a few, I know there's a few people like the town of Wichert Stouffville, Canada Council, Clay, Pace, Clay Space Studio, who you were talking about, helped you with these pieces. Um, yeah. Um, Gallery Nicholas Robert for helping facilitate the show as well. Um, mm -hmm. Is there anyone you wanted to thank or anything, any last things you wanted to tell us about? Well, uh, if if folks don't mind, if anyone is willing to just throw your face up on the thing, thank you for being here. It's really, um, it's really lovely to um, have a conversation um, with you, Tyler. Um, um, thanks for the wonderful questions. Um, you know, you make art in the isolation of your studio and a lot of times you think no one cares. So it's nice to see that 24 people care. No, I'm kidding. But <laughs> <laughs> it's really lovely. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Thank you so much. And again, thank you to everyone who came and um, hopefully we can see you again and see you all in the space soon to see the work in person. Mm -hmm. Looking so. forward to it. Awesome. Take care, everyone. <laughs> Bye now.